I was going to drive for Roger Penske. So I go. Uh, what year were you planning on doing that? That was 1980. So I was going to drive for Roger Penske. So I go to uh, fly to New York, get on a He's Roger. not in the sport. Like, he's sold his car he to was Rod Osterlin. He had the, the Matador. Yeah, but he sold his team. And then he was he had a car. Yeah, yeah Dave Marcus he, drove it, and then, Dave, then Rod, he sold all his cars and everything to Osterlin. So he was coming back in. So, he, yeah, you might be right. You know, <laughs> you're a better historian than I am about some of those things. <laughs> but I'm going to drive for Roger Penske, and I'm pretty excited about that. So I go to Roger's house in, outside of New York. I don't remember where it was. And uh, we have lunch. We eat. And it's okay. Kind of made a deal. So we get back home. And the next day, Roger calls me and said, hey, tear that deal up. He said, the deal's off. I said, what happened? What's wrong? He said, Bill Gardner called me. And Bill Gardner said, if I sign you to a contract and you drive my car, neither one of us will be in racing anymore. He wasn't but happy. He wasn't happy about that at all. You had a contract with him. I had a contract with him. Oh, that's where those contracts come so in handy, So all these damn don't contracts they? were just getting in my way, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they were messing up everything. But anyway, so I, I finished out the year in 1980 with, uh, with, with Die Guard. And then I then – You went to Junior Johnson. Yeah, with Kale Yarbrough. I love Kale. He kind of reminds me of Robert G. really. But Kale came to me in 1980, middle of the year, maybe somewhere along the way, and he put his arm around me. He said, D.W., I'm going to tell you something. I'm leaving juniors. I said, what? He said, I hadn't told anybody else. You're the first person I've told, but I'm leaving juniors. I said, you got to be out of your mind. He just won three championships. Mm -hmm. Win every week. He said, I'm tired of racing every week. I just want to cut back. I'm going to drive for MC Anderson. He said, but here's what I want to tell you. Junior Johnson wants you to drive his car. Junior Johnson wants me to drive his car? I mean, that was like flattering. Because when I was a kid growing up, I was I listened to Junior Johnson on my transistor radio. Mm-hmm. He drove that number three car, that white Chevrolet, and he was he'd been to prison. <laughs> he was a moonshiner. He lived in North Carolina. He lived in Wilkesboro, and he had the best car. He, he had the best car in the sport, and he wanted me to drive it. Well, I was I just that that floored me. Well, but hold on a second before we get there, you. You seem to know it ended badly with Bill yeah. Gardner, but <laughs> you wouldn't you. have been privy to the information about the contract. So, like, was there was there a was there animosity so, that was very public or something? Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, very public. Oh, yeah. So, very. Um, this is you can you can tell us you can breathe, you can fill the gaps here, but by the middle of the year in 1980, um, you and uh, Bill are not communicating no, not at all you're basically uh i'm all right I'm all, you know i can't get out of this contract so i'm gonna finish my season with this 88 car and then i'm i'm moving on bill gardner i i don't, he couldn't have been maybe he was serious but because <clears throat> you say he doesn't know much about racing or didn't well he learned fast though <laughs> he brings bruce jenner and a guy and, and someone else yeah there's uh, I can't remember who else it was, but he brought um, he built he brings Bruce Jenner and uh, someone else to the Charlotte race. Yeah, in the fall. In the fall, and has them interview Bill and Bruce and another athlete. Yeah, I can't remember. It was an Indy car driver. I forget who he was. He they no, interv- okay. they interview Bill and Bruce Jenner and some other athlete about he's like a athlete in another sport yeah and about driving this car yeah hey daryl's leaving but look bruce jenner yeah bruce was a uh you know a, a an big Olympian. deal yes. yeah 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 um he might drive my car next yeah. year you know yeah. dw's eh, no, old news no no dw's gonna be sitting in the grandstand yeah that's what that's he right said. yeah that was the that's what he held over my head that i had this contract it was irrevocable and 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 you couldn't put a value on it when I would try to find out, what do I got to do to get out of this contract? You can't get out of this contract. Uh, you are a, a rare commodity, and there's no way to put a value on this contract. And so it took some finagling to finally get around to what it took to get out of that contract. And my attorney, Ed Silva, and Peter Penzer was uh, Bill Gardner's attorney, and they were talking on the phone one day, and Ed's pretty shrewd, and he was taping the conversation, 
and he asked Peter, he said, just hypothetically, uh, what would it take for DW to get out of that contract? He said, well, he's got three years left. It'd take $100,000 a year at least. That's all we needed. I mean, that was, that was all we needed was a number. So it was $300,000 for me to get out of that contract. And that's oh, what you gave him? That's what we gave him. Oh, it's a... It's a I thought I assumed that your contract was going to run out at the I end of too. the year. Oh no! It no, was a multi-year no, deal. No, I had just signed a new deal. Why did you do that? Well, I was dumb. I was really dumb. I, <laughs> I, I, I was sitting in the car somewhere. I don't remember where. I don't know Daytona, Talladega, somewhere. And they bring the contract to the car before the race. You starts. must have just qualified on the pole or something really right. good. Yeah, I was yeah, feeling good about myself. <laughs> mood. I'm feeling good about myself. Yeah. But I did learn one thing. If somebody says in lieu of, you better be sure you know what that means. <laughs> right, you didn't I found know that. Out, I found out right quick in lieu of, uh, I, I, they had paid me 40% in my expenses. Well, my new contract, I wanted 50% in my expenses. Well, I got to 50%, but it said in lieu of oh. your expenses. So I go to the shop like Monday or Tuesday after one of the races. He said, where's your credit card? I said, I got it right here. Let me have it. What do you want it for? Well, we don't, we're not paying your expenses anymore. You're not? Why not? He said, well, you, you agreed to that. Ugh. I did? Well, I didn't know I did. I didn't, I didn't know what in lieu of meant. Yeah. And so I got 50%, but I lost my expenses, which was pretty large at the time. You guys have a, an answer in the booth on who this yeah, is. Uh, Leah brought up a social thing. You could read read it. Uh, this is from NASCAR Man. In October 1980, Daryl Waltrip announced he was leaving Dygard Racing. To replace him, the owner sent telegrams containing offers to drivers like Mario Andretti, F1 champ Alan Jones, Paul Newman, and Bruce Jenner. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> 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 Mario Andretti. Yeah, right. Paul Newman. Paul yeah, Newman. Right. Bruce Jenner. Like, who else? <laughs> What's O.J. Simpson doing at the time? <laughs> Yeah. So <laughs> it seemed like things were going south throughout the whole team. We didn't care about all that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Math Matthew brings up a good point. The whole team was kind of busting up. Yeah. Um, Robert stuck around though, didn't he? Yates, well, he ends up. He was the big. He he. So Robert Yates is working on that car for years. Yeah. And becomes the head engine guy. Yeah. Did you know Robert Yates was what he was? Oh well, back I then? met Robert at Junior's uh, when I was buying used parts from Junior. Junior run them five hundred miles, then I'd buy them and try to run them five hundred more miles. Sometimes yeah. he did, and sometimes he didn't. But anyway, so he was Robert Yates was working at Junior's, and uh, I lured him away from Junior's to come to, to Diegard to fix the motor issues you were having when Ross, Mario with Rossi. Ra- Rossi uh, he, th- th- we'd put an engine in a car. We'd run ten laps. It'd blow up. Mm. I Same mean, thing. almost every week. Same problem Donnie had driving that car. Yeah, and and I'll never forget. So we bought all these radios, like thirty thousand dollar radios, which is a lot back in the day. And Bill Gardner had a radio or a big headset on. We run about ten laps, and I said, "Blew up." Come, he come down when the race over. He threw the helmet and threw the radios, and he said, "I could have heard that over the PA system." He said, <laughs> "I didn't need no damn radio." So anyway, but yeah, Robert, Robert was, Robert was cool. Robert was one of the coolest. Did you know he was as good of a mo- motor builder? Oh no, I just knew he. I just knew what he could do at juniors. Yeah. I mean, I knew he built some incredibly good engines. Up. I got to tell you this. So the first time I go to Martinsville in juniors car, and I and we're getting ready to, for the race, and uh, I said, "So what gear do y'all run up here? Five sixty seven. What? There's no way you can run a five sixty seven gear at Martinsville." If you have a 454, you can. Mm. <laughs> so so I, that, that was in an era, remember when Bobby uh, protested Richard and at Charlotte Motor Speedway yes. and Richard for having a big motor? And big motors were, like, pretty easy to get by with at that time. How? I, I, they, they, this old guy, Mr. Hyder, I loved him to death, but they pumped the same cylinder every week. I mean, he'd screw things, and that, you know, so they just – paraffin in the cylinders or you know that cylinder would be right and the rest of them be wrong just just all kind of <laughs> yeah. mm. tricky things that you could do because they knew that mr Hyde, you're gonna do the same one because it's only get too real easy with the headers and everything yeah so that's how they ran the big motors <laughs> and they ran them a lot oh yeah and uh matter of fact <laughs> they tried to run one at, well they did win they won in 80 what was that 83 when richard had the big motor at charlotte yes 83 and they caught him mm-hmm. yeah 
Mr. Hyder wasn't on the uh, no 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 on on the business that well, day. <laughs> I think they'd have got away with it, but they put left. Barry Dotson was the crew chief, I think, <laughs> and they put left side tires on the right, soft tires. So they had the left tires on the on the right. They yeah. knew that in Victory Lane, and then I'll never forget uh, Chief. Uh, his, his yeah, he's going down pit lane saying i'm claiming 383 right now 383 <laughs> he said you don't have to tear it down it's a 383 and uh i never forget that and of course that was another whole story but uh humpy wheeler called me i'd, I'd gone a junior mate the junior would matter in hell yeah he made he he, he made us load the car and go home and he left early because richard blew by me and won the race you know and he could not understand how that could happen but he did and uh, so i'm at the hotel and humpy wheeler calls me he says Stand by, you won this race. I said, Yes. I said, he said, Richard had a big motor left side of the ball. He told me all about it. I said, Cheating. I, I knew he was cheating. I knew it had to be. He couldn't drive by me like that if he wasn't doing something. So, anyway, they come on, and, and Bill Gasway, I think, was a, might have been Dick Beatty, but one of those guys. And they said they were going to let the win stand, and they were going to find him $30,000. Well, that's the difference between first and second. If I win, I would have gotten 30000 more, but I didn't. I finished second, so they took my $30,000 and paid his fine with it. Yeah. So, yeah. anyway, yeah. That's, that's another story. So, um, the uh, the 88 Gatorade team's kind of crumbling apart. Yeah. Uh, they've got it back together, and, and Bobby drives for them. Did yeah. you not tell Bobby when he goes to drive for Dygard what, what, what he was, was getting himself into? What was funny was, so, so well, we go – not tell Bobby. Donnie's yeah, yeah. the one that got fired yeah. before. So we go <laughs> yeah, to point. the to the bank on Monday morning with I had the three hundred thousand dollars, which was a, you think they're talking nineteen eighty. Yeah. Three hundred thousand dollars, a lot of money. So we go in, we sit down, we we sign all the papers, and we get ready to leave. And Bill Gar said, Whoa, 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 whoa. You owe me twenty five more thousand dollars. I said, For what? He said, Are you in the bush shoot are you in the bud shootout? Are you in the bush clash? I said yeah, he said. Well, you'll probably win it, and I want my half now. <laughs> so I had to give him twenty five thousand more dollars, three hundred twenty five thousand dollars, on the assumption that you were going to win, and that was going to be the purse, which I did. But <laughs> 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 he was right. <laughs> but I've never heard that. I, I passed Benny on the. I, I passed Benny on the last lap on the apron. I, Benny was hot. But anyway, I won that race anyway. But when I got ready to leave, <laughs> wait a second though. Yeah, that that yeah, keep, keep going. No, when I got ready to leave, well, Ricky Rudd followed me. And Ricky Rudd was sitting in the in the outside office there when I walked out, and I said, "Buddy, you won't last two years with that crowd." I said, "That you, good luck," and that was who took the car. Yeah, I think he drove it one year, maybe one two, year, maybe yeah. And then Bobby got in the car, and they won the championship. And Gary Nelson was a crew chief, and mm. Bobby and I became big rivals, and it was a mess. That, that was Bobby a, had the same sort of. Uh, bad ending on you know he got when they brought sax in trying to run a second yeah. car and bobby's like uh no i don't this ain't what we're doing no and uh he ended up getting pissed and yeah he did take it off yeah uh, uh i'll never forget uh gardner was shrewd i mean he was just he was a businessman he was shrewd uh and so robert yates is the engine guy and they're buying all this equipment for Robert to have for his engine room. And Robert's got a really nice equipment, really nice engine room, and it's all at Diegard. And uh, so the, the deal uh, falls apart, and Robert's going to send ever the movers over to get his equipment because they had been taking money from him every month or every so ever how often it was to pay for the equipment. So Robert had bought the equipment. He owned it. But when they went to shut the deal down, the bank – wouldn't let Robert have his equipment because it was under it was under some big umbrella uh, loan policy, and so Robert ended up with nothing. Ah, and and that's yeah. when Robert went and started a 28 team. Yeah. Wow. With uh, Davy <clears throat> and and uh, he and his son, and you know they did really well. Yeah. So um, talking about uh, Bobby Allison <laughs> getting upset or getting frustrated with the. Sax car. So you were also, and dad, certainly. Yeah. No, none of y'all liked the idea of a two car team. Oh, no. Or a teammate. Why? No. Because, like, well, all of us, I'll just say this, like, and you may have become this way over time, but me and a lot of the guys that I race with, like, a teammates are a necessity. Teammates are, you know, you, you lean on your teams and, and, and try to make yourself better by watching them. Yeah. Um, but back then in the 80s, yeah. 
Uh, uh, Junior Johnson is going to have a second car, basically. Uh, Neil Bonnet, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Neil's going to be. Uh, but y'all were more competitive with that team yeah. than oh, you yeah. were anybody else on the track. Oh, Junior was terrible. The, Neil Bonnet and Tim Brewer would be down there, and he'd go down there and rile them up, and he'd come up here and rile me and Hammond up, you know, that rivalry. But oh, the, he, he would rile up the, the two oh, teams? Yeah, he loved that, yeah. And, and what would he say to you to Oh, do he'd that? say, Neil's going to kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> How you figure that? <laughs> so anyway, that's kind of how it went, you know. Yeah. And Brewer, you know how Brewer was. He's cocky anyway. I got a brand new Rolex, got a pocket full of hundred dollar bills, got a pair of rock ports. I'm doing good. Shag carpet on the wall. Anyway, <laughs> don't you, that's all. Listen, I like shag carpet, but I never put it on the wall. <laughs> oh no, that, we used to get in those hotel it's like to Pocono particularly. You get a honeymoon suite that had shag carpet on the damn wall. You know, with a heart shaped bathtub. <laughs> But anyway, it was just it was just a it's just so different, and and the reason we didn't like teammates is because we didn't have enough parts. Oh, like you'd have one set of cylinder heads, mm, yeah. or you'd have one crankshaft, or you'd have the one. carburetor. Yeah, I mean you had a trick uh-huh. carburetor. You don't want the other guy to have it, and so it was. It wasn't like it is today, where everything you know you build engines. You guess he gets out. He gets everybody gets the same thing. There wasn't any such thing back in the day as everybody gets the same thing. You had something special. You had a qualifying motor that was special. Well, where are we going to get another one? And that's why nobody liked teammates. You just didn't like sharing. You had all these ideas and setups and things that you did, and you don't want to share that with anybody. You don't want them to know what you were doing. You don't want them to be equal to you. If you, if you had an advantage some way, you wanted to keep it. How would that get resolved? Well, it usually didn't. Okay. But, but Rick – Rick was the first guy probably that I remember when I went to drive for Rick in, uh, in 86, uh, and he set us down. He set me down. He said, now, look, you're going to have teammates. Mm. That's the way we operate around here. If you can't deal with that, then you need to do something else. But were you, were you having to fight for parts at Hendrick Motorsports? It was – well, by then, things were starting to – there started to be multiple – you know, uh, the pistons were more – the parts became more and more available. It wasn't a premium back in, oh, like no. at Junior but Johnson's. But in the, in the 70s and 80s, sure. uh, the early part of the 80s, I mean, you you had things that were exclusively yours that you didn't want to let go of to let somebody else yeah. have that advantage. So – There were times at, at Hendrick early on where the teammate stuff, you know, was a problem. Dad, or I'd say dad, but well, Rick had to get him on the floor. What what was yeah, the nature yeah. the of you and Neil and Bonnet? Milk meeting. Yeah, <laughs> well, well, and milk. How were you and Neil Bonnet as far as the relationship then? I mean, I, I, competitive, yes. I, yeah. I, I, I understand the teammate dynamic. But Neil Bonnet seemed like, to me, what I've seen is the most likable guy out there. Is oh, that wrong? The best teammate you could have. Is that right? He, he, he didn't have any he – he, he, he didn't have a big ego. Mm. Um, he was just a – he liked to race. He was a racer. I won – I mean, we ran – I won Nashville – uh, in 85, I guess it was, I think it was, or 84. And uh, he passed me on the last lap of the race. You can't do that. Once you take the white flag, the field is frozen. And Neil passed me on the last lap and came back ahead of me, and they said he won the race. And I, and, 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 and this was Junior. Now, one thing about Junior, you didn't, you know, rules are rules, and you play by the rules. And that, he was pretty strict about that. But so they said, no, you got passed. So Neil won the race. You ran second. I said, no way. We're going to protest. And Dick Beatty was the competition director then. Had the uh, caution come out? That was yeah, the, here's that what was happened. Yeah, here's what happened. We're coming off a of turn four. Okay. I didn't – I stayed out because I didn't have – I had a second-place car. Neil had the best car. Mm-hmm. But they pitted, and they got two tires. Oh. So I stayed out. And so I got by some cars, and there was a little gap between me and Neil, but he was going to win that race if the caution didn't come out. But we're coming off turn four, and the caution comes out. So the white flag and the caution come out together. We're not in the last lap. We're coming to go into the last lap, but we're not in the last Mm -hmm. lap. And that's what Beatty couldn't get through his head, is that the caution came out, but he didn't think about the white flag came Mm -hmm. out with it. Mm -hmm. And so I was already crossed the line when the caution came out. Race is over. And the race is over. But then it was a big mess. Yeah. So I, that night we protested, and we went through the rule book and everything, and Beatty said, I don't care what you say, 
Bonnet won the race. And, and Junior don't care because he's got both cars, first and second. What does he care? I leave that next morning to go to Milwaukee to run a, a bush race. And I get to the airport, and there's a damn caravan waiting for me. And it's NASCAR people. And they said, look, because I thought I would sue y'all. I said, I got proof. And I, what helped me that night was Channel 5, Hope Hines, my friend there, had a cameraman on the flag stand with Harold Kinder. So they're filming the last few laps of that race. And so you see me coming off turn four, and you see the yellow flag and the white flag come out together. And that's what made them change their mind or change that I did win that race. There's evidence. Yeah. So we had, we had them. We knew we had them. I said, I'm going to sue you. <laughs> well, there's three wrecks that ho- coming to the white flag. Oh, so it I was think a mess. the tower was, a, was confused because there was literally three was different wrecks. Chaos. Richard Petty, Bobby was, Allison. Tires blowing out, people running over <laughs> crap, you know, and crews are getting into so it what afterwards. They so that next day they said, we're going to change it. You won the race, but don't say anything derogatory or don't say anything. Uh, I had them all the time. Let I us, knew I had this one in the back. <laughs> let us let us handle it. I gotcha. Said, I don't care what you do as long as I get the trophy. That's all I care. So you just watched that video, and I'm sure you enjoyed it. Well, you need to listen to the whole podcast. The Dale Jr. Download is available on all podcast platforms.